So, wait, did you hit record uh, this time? I did. Here's the thing. We got to preface this whole thing by saying that uh, we took a stab at this a while back before the holidays, and we had a technical snafu, which happens from time to time. Although I, I would, I think it's only happened maybe two or three times in the seven years that I've been doing it, um, and uh, it's just when that happens, <laughs> the pit in my stomach. <laughs> It's the worst. It's the worst feeling. So first of all, my apologies for our technical snafu. And thank you so much for coming back. No, no, no yeah. problem at all. Give, give me a, another yeah. chance to hang out yeah. with the king. No. <laughs> I realized uh, where we went wrong, though, and, and, and why we had a technical problem. I don't know if you'll remember this, but I, I I did not wear the uniform last time. You were wearing a black T-shirt, and I almost invariably wear a black T-shirt for the, for the podcast. And for some reason, I was wearing something else. And I think that that just threw know, everything through, off. Through yeah. The, yeah, yeah, through the <laughs> through the planet off its ballast a little bit. So anyway, here we are. Um, first of all, congratulations on the success uh, of the Blue Zones Kitchen Cookbook. I mean, it's you know once again there you are at the top of the top of the bestseller list. It's it's a, it's pretty cool to see. Well, I spent years writing deeply researched books that were, uh, I, I like to think, artfully crafted when it came to the prose and only to discover what America really wants is beautiful pictures and bean recipes. <laughs> That's it, right? <laughs> uh, but this is not an ordinary cookbook. I mean, this this unfolds much like one of your expeditions, you know, this is, this is a deep dive into these cultures as much as it is about like, here's the thing you can make in your kitchen. Well, yeah, I, I cringe at the title cookbook because actually we tried to make it more like a 250 page National Geographic article. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote, um, the, the introductions are all, uh, science driven, the science of why these foods are, helping these people make it to 100. Uh, I, I think we have the best National Geographic photographer in this genre, David McLean, mm -hmm. shot all the photos. There's no studio shots there. It's all editorial photography. So, and the, and the uh, recipes, uh, none of them are recopied down. I sat on, on a stool and watched these old ladies cook and captured the recipes and then uh, sent them uh, here to Los Angeles, actually, where they were corrected in test kitchens. They don't mm. have tablespoons and measuring cups up you in the You sent the actual people or no. just- the, <laughs> yeah, like, No, just my observations. Right, yeah. But the thing is, this is a 500-year-old food tradition that is disappearing because mm. in all these blue zones, uh, the American food culture is coming and replacing this way of eating that has produced the statistically longest lived people. You know, 20 year olds aren't eating like this. So I was sitting with 70, 80, 90, even 100 year olds watching them cook the foods of their right. youth. So this is almost a, a uh, project of anthropology yeah. as much as, you know, a food book. Creating an historical document. I like to think it is. Yeah. In the 15, you've been doing this for 15 years, sort of blue zone specific type work. What are the changes that you've seen specifically within the blue zones over the last decade and a half? And which which ones have been the most impact, impacted by kind of Western development? I'll start with the negative and then we'll move to the positive. So the, the place that's been hit the worst is Okinawa. When I first started, the, I actually first went there in 1999, which was 21 years mm -hmm. ago. And uh, our sort of kind of test expedition, it was pr at the time producing the longest lived people in the history of the world. Uh, about 60 times more, fe I'm sorry, 30 times more female centenarians in people over 60 than you'd have in the United States. And uh, now it is the least he healthy prefecture in all of, all of Japan. It's got the highest oh, rates wow. of obesity, the highest rates of diabetes. And it has undergone the the the, the worst degeneration of of any of the blue zones, but you also see it, uh, it, it pretty hit pretty hard in Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, where Nicoya itself, this place where they have this beautiful, simple, elegant three ingredient recipe that is driving much of, much of their longevity. You come into town now, and the first thing you see is a KFC, and it just makes your wow. your your heart sink. And at the same time. Longevity is plunging and the chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease that are killing Americans are rising there. And uh, within a half a generation or so, um, the, these blue zones will just be part of the That's mush. Tragic. I mean, it feels like 
in the same way that certain neighborhoods within uh, cities kind of protect their historical heritage and won't let you build. And, you know, you, you have to build to a certain way or you can't build or you can't renovate these buildings to protect and preserve the, the you know, the, the kind of historic nature of them. Is it not possible to go to the the governments of these blue zones and you know give them some kind of certification that 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 protects the heritage there? Is that even possible, or is that just a weird idea? No, it's a great idea, and in fact, I've met with the presidents of of Costa Rica, and you know now onto the good news is uh, the government there has proclaimed Nicoya Peninsula uh, the blue zone as a as sort of a national heritage site, mm -hmm. which has afforded it protections for older people and more funding to help preserve older people and the cultures of older people. You see that more organically in Ikaria, Greece, which is another blue zone. Uh, the, a real kind of tourist industry has, has sprouted up around uh, people interested in longevity. So what you see there is older people where in many cultures, they're kind of marginalized. They're the heroes. They're the, uh -huh. the um, repositories of wisdom and kind of the local celebrities, especially the centenarians. And in the blue zone of Sardinia, and this is where the world's longest lived men come from, uh, there are six villages there in the Noral province. And they're in one of them, a place called Seulo, there's a blue zone center. And there's one street, it's probably 100 meters long, and there's like 12 centenarian houses on that 100 meters. And out in front of the house, there's huge post posters, photographs of the centenarians. Oh, wow. So they're really they're celebrating like this as a national, as a, as a treasure. Uh -huh. um, and in these places, there's a kind of an act of will to, um, you know, be, keep at bay these, these modern influences. So is that the positive side of this coin? When 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 I asked you that question, you said, "Well, I'll start with the negative." Yes, the positive is in some blue zones they're seeing what a um, resource their uh, their older people specifically and and their this lifestyle uh, and they're trying to preserve them both. Yeah, are you optimistic that they're going to be able to kind of preserve and protect the heritage and and you know the sort of uh, culture of these places? No, yeah. <laughs> I don't think so because <laughs> oh no, uh, there might be yeah. in sort of a museum sort of way, um, an effort to do it. But uh, it's I think the the forces of of um, of the the world we live in are too strong. The urge mm. to motorize, mechanize, engineer out physical activity out of our lives with ease and air conditionings and power tools and kitchen gadgets and electronics and uh, packaged food and ultra processed foods. And it's that, that, that tsunami is just too powerful, I think, to, to, um, for, you know, point old traditions to hold up. Yeah. Do you have a favorite blue zone? I have two favorites. Uh, the, Icaria probably. Icaria right? is where my- it seems like the one you keep going back yeah, to. Yeah. It's, I, I go back almost every year. My son got married there. Oh, wow. And there's a place called Thea's Guest House in Nas, which I like to think is the the center of, of the Blue Zones. Very, you know, you go there and you, during the day it looks, the, the, you don't see any furniture. There's kind of this empty terrace and and and, and there's nobody around. But at night, the 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 terrace has a, a trellis which is lit up, and you're overlooking the Aegean Sea. And people from the village come in, and you'll get Israelis and Europeans and and Americans, and it tends to be people who are making a life transition, and they all meet on this on this terrace, and they eat Blue Zones foods, and they drink wine, and and uh, during the day I, they go out in the fields and they hike, and they they go by the sea, and and it's nice to see this um, this place in the world where you can go find your own Blue Zone, so to speak. Uh -huh. Is is uh are these places because of the work that you've done now becoming tourist destinations? Are there people that seek them out and want to visit them because they've read about them in your books or heard about them? They're all yeah. tourist destinations, and 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 for that I think they appreciate. Uh, but you know when tourists comes, it creates a, you know problems of its own. But but um, yes, they're all tourist destinations. I think Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica is most. Um, um, made 
uh, most embrace blue zones. So there's lots of hotels are claiming blue zones. And, you know, you land in the airport in Liberia and the first thing uh-huh. you see is a blue zone store. Oh, wow. And, uh, but- uh, But it's on the other side of the peninsula from like where all the fancy hotels are, isn't it? No, it's on the same peninsula. Oh, it it's just it's the Koya Peninsula. It's, it's um, Tamarindo and um, people also know of um, Nosara, which is kind of a- right. uh, Tamarindo is the surf village place, right? That's Montezuma. Oh. Montezuma is on the Southern tip of the Nicoya Peninsula and more towards the North is Tamarindo and that, there's where the Four Seasons is. Okay. And kind of halfway between or, is Samara, which is a, a hipsy dipsy beach town. And then Nosara, which is kind of a vortex for surfers and for mm-hmm. yo- the yoga mm-hmm. scene. It's actually a cool place. Both of them are cool places. That's actually not the blue zone. The blue zone is actually inland, up in the highlands, uh, in the villages. And they're the type of villages where, you know, tourists drive through and leaving a cloud of dust and don't don't really realize what they see. To to find the blue zone, you need to go into people's homes and you need to stop long enough to see detail and to get a feel for what it's like to live in these places, to see how they cook, to see how they downshift, to see how they live out their purpose, to see how they connect socially. There's all these sort of non-food characteristics that account for as much of their longevity as eating beans or tofu. Yeah. I mean, to do that work, you would have to have a lot of emotional intelligence and a lot of patience. You know, you, you, I mean, you're a very charismatic, personable guy. Um, you've got to engender the trust of these people to even get into the position where they're going to allow you to come into their home and participate in their traditions. You do. I was blessed rich with, um, curiosity and 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 a genuine uh, affection for t- traditional peoples everywhere i mean they fascinate me so i'm not going in trying to get the story and get out uh-huh. when i did this original work i was spending months at these places and not in a, you know there's one there's a 3 day stretch where i moved in with the 102 year old woman in okinawa neither of us had a common language and i just sat and watched her and what count it, she got up and down off the floor 40 times in one day. It's like Mm -hmm. doing 40 squats. Mm -hmm. Um, Watched how she made her breakfast, how she uh, stood up on a stool and was washing her dishes. At a certain point, she pulled out her denture and scrubbed them with the same (laughs) brush and put her dentures back in. Um, But just saw the sort of constant movement and the flow of people who came and visited her and that she'd sort of toddle out to her garden and that range of motion. And you don't really get, um, you can't really just go in and ask them about their lives and leave because people don't really remember their lives. Uh, to do this project right, you have to live with them and pay attention to the detail and the nuance. And then you can sort of go into the academic literature and say, to find out, well, they're doing this one thing. Is there any sort of academic underpinnings mm-hmm. or evidence for why this would be yielding longevity? Mm-hmm. So- in the example of that particular woman, what does she think is going on? <laughs> You're just like, she's the guy no in the idea. corner. Yeah. <laughs> like, what could I possibly be doing that would be I'm so sure interesting to no that damn guy? I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. introduced to her, and I remember it was a rainy, like, Tuesday morning, and um, I took off my shoes, and you sort of step up to she has one of these stilted houses. And I sat cross legged across from her on a tatami mat, and we looked at each other and smiled. And I, I knew like one arigato, arigato uh-huh. you know, one Japanese word, arigato. And then we looked at each other, s- stared and smiled, and sat there for about 10 minutes. And finally she got bored and got up <laughs> and went about her day. And I just followed her. <laughs> like, he's still there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> oh my I'm, God. I'm obviously not going to get rid of him. Uh-huh. No, but no, I, later on her, her granddaughter came and we had a, a translated conversation. It was very nice. Well, just by way of, of background and context uh, for for those people listening or watching who who are new to kind of your work, um, I think it would be helpful to just kind of provide a, a quick synopsis of what this whole blue zone, zones thing you know is about. It started out as a National Geographic project to, in a sense, reverse engineer longevity. Something called the Danish Twin Study established that only about twenty percent of how long. Uh, the average person lives is dictated by genes. The other 80% is something else. So the project um, 
began by hiring demographers to find places where people are living statistically longest. And that alone took two years, cost about a quarter million bucks before I could even start. But, you know, you don't want to go to a place that's just hearsay and and try to distill out lessons. So uh, with uh, demographers, we found these these longevity hotspots, which I've dubbed blue zones, and then brought in another team of experts to find the correlations. And we use um, the methodology of anthropology, epidemiology to kind of tease out the common denominators. So we found longevity hotspots in Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Ikaria, Greece, Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, and not far from here, uh, the Loma Linda, California, and the Seventh-day Adventists. Mm -hmm. And over the past 15 years, I've been studying these cultures in an, in a, in an effort to preserve this um, interconnected set of factors that are common to all these places that are yielding longevity. And um, the first uh, big breakthrough was a cover story for National Geographic, uh, Secrets of Long Life, and then came a book, Blue Zones, Nine Lessons for the uh, on Living Longer from the People Who Live the Longest, Blue Zones Solution, Blue Zones of Happiness. And now at a certain point, what really explains longevity is complex and it's multifactorial. But at a certain point, I realized that when it comes to changing your health behaviors, for most Americans, the change comes through their mouth. So this idea to do a Blue Zones kitchen and capture these recipes and these images uh, was really an idea to, I guess, appeal to um, a, a wider spectrum of Americans and kind of lure them into this, this um, deeper and, and more complex uh, prescription for longevity. And it, it seemingly it's worked. Right. So amongst these populations, none of them are are striving for longevity. They're not thinking about it. They're not going to the gym. They're not dieting. Their lifestyles are set up in a certain way that is conducive to them becoming centenarian, right? The, the foods they eat, the manner in which they interact with their community uh, and, and interact you know, throughout their daily lives in a physical sense, all of these things kind of contribute to this um, set of parameters that you have kind of distilled down and, and canonized. That's right. So the, the, I would say the big epiphany, and it took me 10 years to, to make this realization. You know, in, in America, we tend to pursue health. We find a diet or we find an exercise program or we, 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 we get a coach or we um, get on a supplement program and we think, well, we got to find this program. We need the discipline, the focus of mind, and and we're going to go after it. You know, and, and the vast majority, ninety plus percent of people, fail at what they start and within a year. Mm -hmm. In blue zones, these people are eating mostly plant based foods. They're moving every twenty minutes or so. They're hugely socially connected. They're suffused with purpose, not because they've tried. It's because they're a product of their environment. They, they live in places where the cheapest and most accessible foods is peasant food. Mm -hmm. It's whole grains, it's nuts, it's greens, it's, it's uh, tubers. Um, so uh, it's cheapest and most accessible and they have these time-honored recipes to make them taste good and their kitchens are set up so they can make them easily. So of course they're gonna eat that. It's a lot easier to eat that than you know, to travel to a big city and buy uh, processed foods. Um, they don't have these mechanized conveniences in their houses. Um, so they're, they're not turning to some, you know, power tool to do their work. They're kneading uh, bread by hand or grinding corn by, by hand. They're doing garden work by hand. Um, the, the option to implode into their homes onto their electronics isn't there because within a uh, day, if you're not showing up to uh, the village center or the party or church, somebody's knocking on your door the to get you to show up. Yeah, yeah the accountability. Yeah, there's a certain expectation, and um, nobody wakes up wondering what their position is in their community. There's always a very clear sense of purpose and sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, you know that the Okinawans use this word ikigai. 
people are starting to use that word a lot, sense of purpose. And it really does make a big difference when it comes to longevity, probably eight extra years of life expectancy. But the purpose experience in Blue Zones isn't the sort of follow your passion purpose that we think of in America. You know, we think, well, we, we're going to retire or, you know, we get, we're, and now we, um, I got some free time on my hand. I'm going to travel or I'm going to play golf or, or um, pursue knitting, whatever it is. Purpose in Blue Zones is, is uh, spliced with responsibility. So when, when people think of purpose, it's always connected to um, putting the focus back on somebody else. It's making sure the younger generation um, thrives. It's, it's making sure that the community is taken care of, making sure certain practices are preserved. Mm -hmm. There's always an altruistic element to purpose in the blue zones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a corresponding uh, aspect of res responsibility. Right. That's right. Yeah. So it's it's almost a hybrid between purpose and responsibility. Right. You fuse those two, and that's that's the blue zone purpose. Right. And telescoping up from this, what's really interesting is this perhaps somewhat counterintuitive notion that infuses the work that you now do with cities by virtue of the blue zones project, which is kind of a rejection of human self will, in a manner of speaking, to say. Look, you know, getting people to exercise, making them feel bad if they don't, even if you incentivize them to do so, whether it's dieting, weight loss, whatever, all of these kind of health parameters that underpin how we think about uh, health and fitness and well-being in the developed world just don't work. Yeah. They don't work. And the solution can be extracted from these traditional communities by observing the way that they live their lives and trying to create environments that are conducive to making the right choice. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, it, it burns me up hearing these, these uh, finger-wagging politicians saying that it's, uh, it's individual responsibility. It's your responsibility to be healthy. But then you unleash people in the toxic food environment um, you know, I were, I, we blue zone the whole state of Iowa and there was a lot of sort of local politicians who were saying, well, we endorse blue zones, but we think it's mostly individual responsibility. How are you going to ask a single mother who's barely making ends meet with a, with her 10 hour a day job to go out into the food environment where 97 out of a hundred choices are bad and say, go find good choices for your mm -hmm. kids. Uh, I, I actually believe that if you're unhealthy and overweight in this country, which is 71% of American populations, it's not their fault. You, you go back to 1970, we had about a third the rate of obesity we have today. And is that because there were better exercise programs or people were more responsible, responsible in the you know, post-hippie age, 1970, or because we had um, uh, better diets or were better educated? No. You know, our environment has changed and uh, the very clear lesson that we get from Blue Zones is here's environments that we know are producing the statistically longest lived and healthiest populations. And when I say longest lived, I don't mean they have better genes that are going to make them live to 120. What I am saying is they're avoiding heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and dementia the diseases that foreshorten your life. So they're getting the full 95 years or so, which is the capacity of the human machine. If you're listening to this right now, your body is right to the, to the, um, the extent we science understands the human body. Your body's capacity is 95 if you do all the right things. These populations are achieving that 95 year mark better than any other population in the world. And they're doing it because they live in the right environment. Right. They don't have to go out of their way to do it. it it's just right in front of them. It's mindless. Do. That is the choice to be made. So when you look at the United States of America, I mean, where do we fall on longevity right now? Like, four, like 49th or yes, something like yeah, that? We do, like we right do up there with job. Bangladesh or something. <laughs> no, we're not, <laughs> like, we're, we're not yeah, that bad. We're I not, mean, and it dropped the it last three good. years too. Yeah. It dropped... It, there's been a little bump upward because we're seemingly getting this opioid 
uh, crisis a little bit under control. But the previous three years, we've seen uh, life expectancy drop for the first time in living history, first time mm-hmm. in a century since mm-hmm. the, the the big flu epidemic in 1917. So no, we're we're going the wrong direction here, and the percentage of our GDP we spend on avoidable um, diseases. Uh, about three point seven trillion dollars keeps going up every year. It's, it's a statistical certainty it'll bankrupt our country if it continues on the trend, and it's it's all because of diseases that that result because of the environment we live in. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the environment, the culprits that I see are subsidized, cheap, processed food, uh, suburban sprawl. Uh, the 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 advent of the automobile, like there are there are certain kind of like seismic forces, cultural forces that have kind of led us to this place. Like people are more separated geographically. We're reliant on 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 our own personal cars versus public transportation. We're not living in consolidated, well thought out urban environments. Our access to healthy food um, creates socioeconomic problems, and you know we we're, we're dealing with. With that, with that kind of like suburban, you know, growth, we see the degeneration of inner cities and thus the the um, the kind of food deserts that spring up that further exacerbate that socioeconomic and and health divide. It's a lot like remember that old experiment: if you threw a, a frog in boiling water, it would leap out, but if you threw it in lukewarm water and turned up the water one degree at a, uh, at a time, the, the sure. it would cook the frog. That's kind of what's happening to us. I mean, in the 1940s, 50s, even 60s, the American food and built environment was actually pretty healthy. Most people walked, you know, you cooked at home. Uh, There was a better balance between animal foods and plant-based foods. Um, Having a, you know, uh, going out for a hamburger and French fries was an occasional treat, not a daily event. And what's happened is, first of all, every um, city engineer since the Eisenhower administration has been taught to build a street that gets as many cars as possible down it. So there's this sort of uh, pervasive mindset in among city planners that, you know, we want to build for cars and traffic. So that starts uh, marginalizing the human. It's unsafe. Um, There's no decent sidewalks. It's the streets are ugly. Um, They're stressful because cars are whizzing by. Um, There, there are, there are uh, cities that are trying to reverse that trend, but it's going to take some years. Uh, our food environment, uh, ever since Earl Butts, Nixon's uh, Secretary of Agriculture, um, he made uh, trans, trans fats uh, before his time were used only as an industrial lubricant. He made them a food. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- that's been a problem. But also this um, system we have that favors corn, soybeans, uh, sugar beets and wheat. You know, none of those products are bad by themselves, but they're mostly grown in the service of feeding other anim- feeding animals. Um, and there's too much of it. It's a very cheap input. So American ingenuity takes these these cheap um, uh, core products and they uh, uh, process them and they add value. They market the heck out of them. They strip them of most of their nutrients and. Uh, now the the ten billion dollars a year is spent marketing us things like sugared cereals and chips and sodas and crackers and and these things that actually have their roots in pretty good food, uh, but by the time they get to us, they're stripped of the nutrients and they're metabolically horrible for us, mm-hmm. and you can't get away from them. Mm-hmm. What about the car? Well, we all need cars, but there's this idea of um, induced demand. What what happens in most cities is there's a popular part of town, cars start to, the traffic chokes it, and the politician under pressure does the the intuitive thing. They widen the lane or put two more lanes in or, or, or or rise the speed limit from 30 to 50, so cars... And what happens invariably is when you make it easier for cars, it induces the demand for more cars. So you put two more lanes in and within 
three to five years, those lanes are mm -hmm. full because people say, no, it's easier to drive places. But when you do the counterintuitive thing and you narrow lanes and you slow down traffic, we call it a, a road diet and you widen the sidewalks and you make a bike lane, which actually causes cars to slow down even more. At a certain point, people do one of two things. They realize, wow, it's actually easier for me to walk or take the bus or bike to these places or the driving pressure is such that they move closer to work or they move mm -hmm. into a neighborhood. And this happens gradually. We want things to happen overnight. But we could probably eliminate 20 to 25% of the obesity problem in this country if we designed our cities for human beings and not just cars. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of the approach when you go to these cities and, and work with them to try to create you know, a, a Blue Zone certified urban environment, right? Yes. Like how can we create systems to promote, you know, human movement over personal automobiles? So let me just give you some content, uh, context on these Blue Zones projects. So most of the time when people think of, uh, of uh, community health, they're trying to promote diet or exercise programs, et cetera. We don't do any of that. We assume that people are genetically hardwired to crave sugar, fat, salt, and take rest whenever they can. And instead of trying to fight that by, as you point out, incent them or guilt them. Shame or, them. Shame them. We say, no, we're, we're just going to set this, these individuals up. Uh, for success, to make the healthy choice, not only the easy cho choice, uh, but in some cases, the only choice. So how do you do that? So in each city, I have three teams. One, The first team is a policy team. And we have experts on building streets for humans, on changing the food environments to favor fruits and vegetables over junk food, and to favor the non-smoker over the smoker. And we don't come in and try to nanny stake the city government. We come in and say, here's a menu of 30 evidence-based policies that have worked elsewhere to make a city healthier. You've hired us to come in. Actually, the insurance company hires us to come in. Uh, we help them choose from each of these policy areas eight to 10 policies that would be feasible in that city and effective in that city. Mm -hmm. And then our experts help make sure they get implemented. So an example, if you live in a neighborhood where there are more than six fast food restaurants in a 500, um, 500 feet from, from the average house, the obesity rate in that neighborhood is about 35% higher than the same neighborhood with fewer than three fast food restaurants. So one of our um, proposals is that you limit the number of licenses for fast food restaurants. Mm -hmm. If you live in a neighborhood where there are billboard advertising for junk food, the obesity rate in that neighborhood is about 10% higher than the same neighborhood without billboards ads. So one of the things in our menu is uh, a ban on billboard advertising. And you know nobody misses the billboard ad advertising. And lo and behold, the obesity rate goes down in those neighborhoods. So we're going to try to get eight or 10 policies passed. Then we have a second team that administers a Blue Zone certification program for schools, restaurants, grocery stores, workplaces, and churches. And those, it's sort of like lead certification for health. Mm -hmm. And then we have a third team that gets 15% of individuals, it's kind of a tipping point at 15%, to take a Blue Zone pledge uh, and we get them to take checklists into their home to optimize their home environment for better eating and more movement, optimize their social network. We create these MOIs. And then we give them a free purpose workshop and get them volunteering. And if you can orchestrate the perfect storm, people, places, and policies, and keep enough energy behind it for five years, in every case, obesity drops, diabetes drops, life expectancy goes up, and people's life satisfaction, as reported to Gallup, goes mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. And it's not because we change individuals or shamed individuals, it's because we optimize their environment. Right, and the insurance companies love it. They got a, then the phone rings again, Dan, you're doing a great job. We've got a new city for you. We're saving so much money. <laughs> well, Fort yeah. Worth, our biggest, the, uh, Gallup estimates yeah. that our project occasioned about a quarter of a billion dollars a year wow. in uh, avoided healthcare cost. And that will continue to accrue because we change. And now we're, we're starting with uh, Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, Tom set them all over there and, and uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. Um, we, we got a blueprint in place for Orlando, which is now 3 million people. It's actually all of Orange County. So the, um, 
the the challenge gets bigger every time, but it's a, it's a worthy challenge. Yeah, and and you know, look, we can talk about plant based diets and ikari and stew, and you know, planting a garden in your backyard. But first, we got to get the soda machines out of the schools. We got to get people, you know, walking and riding their bikes a little bit, maybe not sitting so much, you know, at at, at their job. Like very basic, simple things. Some of which I would imagine are, are are kind of easy to implement when you go to these cities, and others, you know, perhaps require you know zoning and and other kind of regulatory changes in order to implement. Yeah. See, if you get focused on the silver bullet. Um, you're going to fail. We have what we call silver buckshot. So between our people policy and and uh, places strategy, we probably unleash eighty to ninety long term nudges mm-hmm. and defaults that are going to favor the healthy choice over the unhealthy choice. We're going to fail with twenty or thirty of them, but the other fifty or sixty have enough influence enough of that sort of Adam Smith silent hand nudge yeah. that we you you see behaviors change and that's the big secret it, you know until we have the courage to take on our environment and stop with this fairy tale that we're magically going to get 330 million Americans to a find the right diet b muster the discipline to stay on the diet and three have focus of mind to keep on it for uh, the decades necessary to avoid a com- chronic disease we're not nothing's not we're not going to you know as they say bend the curve we're not going to do much with this obesity problem it's till we sort of take on um the places we eat our foods where we go to work uh our city our city policies and the the the, our food and built environment where america is going to continue to spend needless money and suffer needlessly Mm. from chronic disease yeah I mean, I just know it in my own life. We live, you know, my life is an embarrassment of riches. We live in this beautiful, you know, part of the world. I have an incredible view and I'm surrounded by mountains and sunshine and, you know, it's phenomenal. But uh, I live very far from an urban environment, so I'm not doing a lot of walking. And I'm also geographically distant from most, most of my friends. And I feel that in my life. I go to New York City. I'm walking from Soho to Midtown. I'm seeing tons of friends in a single day. You know, it's a it's it's a completely different experience that is dictated not because I'm making choices, but because the environment lends itself to me making different types of choices that then completely change how I live my life and and experience that day. Yeah, and they're not even conscious choices yeah, I'm not right even now. Aware. You know, if you want a, a, a bottle of soy milk, you got to get in your car here and right. drive. But if you live in New York or, you know, downtown Minneapolis, like me or Santa Barbara up the street, you can walk to that. And it's just easier to, you know, walk to the corner store than it is to- And you probably know the guy in the store. Yeah. And you run into your neighbors on yeah. the way by and it, you know, fends off this other uh, huge toxic- uh, um, uh, epidemic we're suffering in America around loneliness, mm-hmm. which is also- shaped. I mean, friendship and connection is a huge part of, of of your work and focus. So maybe let's spend a little time on that. Well, first of all, I think uh, your social connectivity is much, is a function of your environment as well. Uh, if you live in a cul-de-sac in some soulless suburb, suburb where there's no sidewalks to the neighborhood, you have to walk out in the street to get to the neighbor. Or if you want to go to a church or a, or a cafe to have a cup of coffee, you have to get in your car. The number of spontaneous social interactions, which may lead to a connection or a friendship, just the numbers go down by a factor of ten, as opposed to living in a in a um, uh, con- more population dense. Um, a walkable community where people are bumping into um, potential friends all the time. Mm-hmm. But in our Blue Zones project cities, you know, to our earlier discussion, people are imploding into their handheld devices and their iPads. And and uh, we have this very um, intentional program called Moais, where we bring auditoriums of people in, and we actually manually connect them with four or five other friends, um, um, helping them um, connect on based on shared values, shared interest, and shared schedule. Mm-hmm. And then we just get them walking together for 10 weeks, 
or eating plant-based potlucks together for 10 weeks. And about 60 or 70% of the time, they stay together for, for, so far we've been able to track them as much as seven years. And so they're staying together wow. seven years. And we know um, you are hugely influenced by your friends. So if you're hanging out with people who are drinking or smoking, you're 60 or 70% more likely to drink and smoke yourself. Whereas if you're hanging out with people who are walking every day yeah. or are gathering around great plant-based food, um, th those behaviors are going to become the contagious. You know, mm -hmm. it's the same sort of nudge uh, philosophy that pervades all of our work. Maori, is that an Okinawan word? Moai. Moai. M-O-A-I. Right. It's, it comes from... It actually has its roots in in agricultural past where there weren't banks. So five farmers would come together and they'd meet every week and they'd throw in money every time they met. And then when one of them had a need to buy seed for the next, there was a, a, a fund of money that they could draw from. Uh, that tradition exists to this day, but it's mostly social. And it's essentially a committed circle of friends who travel through life together and support each other when the chips are down and share when the chips mm. are bountiful. That's beautiful. I love that. It's not just about cooking the food together or, or participating in a healthy activity. It's the connectivity. It's the it's the the congealing of the group and the relationships that are formed. Yes. And it's a constant thing. Yeah. It, I, I, I sat with five women from the same Moai who get together every night, drink sake, Argue about who the hot guy <laughs> <laughs> they like best back in 1941. Uh -huh. Is this uh, another one of you? You found your way into the house and you're sitting yeah, against the yeah, wall. Uh, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, I'm sure they had no idea what the hell I was yeah. doing there. But they, uh, their average age is 102. They've been meeting mm -hmm. er, almost every day for 97 years, and you could see that. I I sat that with them two nights. Second night, one of the ladies didn't show up, and the other four put their kimonos on and shuffled over to their neighbor's house to check on them. So instead of a nurse or some sort of electronic gadget checking on it, it's this beautiful social construct that worked without government intervention or without you know business getting involved. It was, you just, you just uh, create it, uh, give it some momentum and inertia can keep it going for mm. decades. If you were given the task of, of creating a brand new city out of whole cloth, like there's just a, like a basically a blanket piece of land and you're charged with constructing an urban environment. You, you're the new, you know, Pierre L'Enfant or whatever, looking at how to design Washington, D.C. or whatever it is. Like what are, how do you begin that process? Like what is the city of the future, the ultimate blue zone city of the future look like? And, and you know, how is it kind of oriented around these principles? Well, I can tell you, when developments are are developed at eye level, you know you have this model, and there's somebody looking up above, down. That always fails. The design happens to it has to begin, I think, at at eye level. Um, but it, it it starts with a a core of um, I, you know you almost look at these sort of Mexican cities where they have a zocalo. You you want a a, a social Where? square in the middle of it, you know these the way cities evolved in in Europe fairly um, uh, consistently. No matter if you're in Spain or or Italy or France and or Greece or it's it's not a coincidence. There's a certain amount of human ingenuity and and um, uh, observed wisdom that's baked into these city designs and. In Europe, so you, if I had to design a city right here, in the hills outside of Los Angeles, I'd I'd start with a um, a social square around that. I would have um, uh, restaurants and cafes, outdoor restaurants and cafes. I wouldn't let any cars in that central area. You want mixed use, so people can live upstairs. Uh, and they can do their shopping or the socializing on the first floor. Mm -hmm. um, you would have the the streets would be designed first for humans. I would probably argue in the very downtown, maybe six square blocks, there'd be no cars at all. It would all be pedestrian. But uh, at night, cars can come in and delivery trucks could come in mm -hmm. and deliver food. But um, people don't miss their cars if if um, 
if they if they live close enough to the places that they socialize or shop or go to work, um, I would uh, I, I would loosen up on the density as you get towards the periphery. But what you see in all of the happiest and longest lived cities in America, Boulder, Colorado, Portland, Oregon, San Luis Obispo, is a green belt. There's a certain um, uh, they're sort of designed like a donut and the donut holes where the people live and the, and the donut itself is places to recreate, uh, green spaces, places to go hike, places to bike. So you, you want to keep the, pr the development pressure focused inward and not let it sprawl outward, which mm -hmm. is what the mistake, the vast majority of cities make in this country. And, you know, if you have the economic influence, uh, pointing inward, uh, that's when the in ingenuity comes in. There's pressure to make high quality of life. You can't just create huge spaces and to make better use of the roadways and the walkways and, and uh, the retail space. Mm -hmm. So of all the cities in the world right now, which city do you think best captures that ethos? Like who's doing it right? Uh, Ohus, uh, Denmark is doing a great job, which is the second Ohus. biggest city in Denmark. Um, or Copenhagen too. I mean, mm -hmm. they 1970. They had they were choked with traffic like a lot of American cities are. Now over 50 percent of all trips are taken on bicycle. Yeah, and this is in a cold area. And they did that. That didn't come about by coincidence, but it was this slow sort of uh, pressure gently applied over over decades to favor the cyclist over the motorist. Um, Santa Barbara right near here, they're doing everything right. Uh, they're favoring a healthy food environment. They're favoring, um, they, they've hired a bicycle coordinator to come in and make sure that the agenda, there's there's somebody always saying, well, if you're going to design this new street, you, you, there needs to be a pedestrian place. And a, mm, right. Um, other great cities, Naples, uh, Florida, believe it or not, has done a very good job uh, in the United States. Um Boulder, Colorado, yeah, one of the best. But they're always intentional. They're always stem from an enlightened group of leaders who shift their focus away from just economic development, which tends to be the thrust to quality of life uh, policies. And they just sequentially bring on quality of life uh, um, policies and get them implemented. And lo and behold, after about a decade or so, you see obesity plummeting dependably. And you see people's reported well-being or life satisfaction yeah. go up. I was in Copenhagen uh, last summer. I was there right at midsummer, so everybody's out. It's light out, you know, until eleven o'clock at night. And I was delighted and very struck with just how different their lifestyle is compared to the way that yeah. I'm living mine. I mean, <laughs> I was like, we just have it all wrong. You know, they're, everyone is together. The cafes are packed, bicycles everywhere, people sunning themselves and jumping them into the waterways and in boats. And it just, I don't know, it, it, it made a huge impact on me. And you said that, um, that it was once traffic choked. So what did they, like what happened that they were able to like make that switch? There's an architect by the name of Jan Gehl, J-A-N-G-E-H-L, who first, one of the first in the world to realize the importance of walkability and bikeability. And he went to the city council and he sort of pitched these ideas for um, redesigning their streets so that it favored bikes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just literally, you start with the bike lane you slow down traffic. If traffic moves too fast, people get killed. You know that if you get hit by a car going uh, 20 miles an hour, your chances of living are 90%. If you get hit by a car going 30 miles an hour, your chances of living drop to 40%. And if you get uh, hit by a car going uh, 40 miles an hour, your chance of living drops at chance, uh, 10%. So there's this whole sort of playbook where you look at the streets through the lens of a cyclist, uh, calming traffic, narrowing car lanes, creating a protected bike lane. Trees make a huge difference. People like to walk on streets where there are trees. Um, so it's minimizing the noise, minimizing the, the stress, 
minimizing the danger and maximizing the aesthetics and people come. And Copenhagen just did that systematically over the course mm. of 40 years and so quite frankly as Boulder, Colorado and San Luis Obispo. Yeah. Aren't there all these crazy studies on sidewalks, like just how wide they need to be or how how tall the lip on the curb needs to be in order to kind of make it as conducive as possible to people making use of them? Yes. Yes. So, um, well, in, as a rule, you, you want a sidewalk as wide enough to get a outdoor cafe on there if, uh -huh. you, if you're in a city. Um, yes, if, if, um, if there is a danger, if one dangerous curb... Uh, or one dangerous intersection, even though you might have a perfect sidewalk, but one dangerous intersection, and you have you know some old lady who would normally walk to church that way, but there's that one dangerous place, they won't walk. So you really do need to have um, a, an expert who knows how to to assess the whole built environment and um, think of it as a a, a whole, a continuum. Mm. We have a guy on our team named Dan Burden, who is a, a direct descendant of, of that Jan Gell in, in Copenhagen. So he 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 knows all these techniques and he's developed them over 40 years. It's it's kind of a new science and it's counterintuitive because most engineers want more traffic. Um, but when you sit down and listen to him and you see the results of a walkable city over a, a city that's that's um uh, overwhelmed with automobiles like Los Angeles, the quality of life is just vastly different. Yeah. I mean, what about, you know, making space for community gardens, like all these these things where people can come together and participate in a joint activity, grow their own food together, right in an urban environment. What would happen if, if Manhattan outlawed all cars, except for perhaps delivery vehicles or, you know, a certain limited number of, of taxis and really amped up the public transport. What would happen to that city? How would it transform? There would be, so, there would be two or three years of getting used to it yeah. and then they wouldn't miss it. Would it would be chaos at first, I would yeah. imagine. Yeah, I mean, you have sort <laughs> yeah. of, you know, people who can't walk eight blocks, not being able to mm. hail a cab to get to work. But then I think it, they, would, they would be replaced by these sort of rickshaw cyclists, mm -hmm. which you see going up and down the Avenue of the Americas all the time. Right. Uh, we would adapt. I don't, I don't, I think more people would take the subway. Um, um, you know, if you just, uh, so Singapore does this. Singapore, um, Singapore is far more densely populated than New York City. Singapore is number two in the world with the highest population density, no traffic problem at all. Why? Because they they only allow a fixed number of permits to drive, and those permits are available via auction. Mm -hmm. So they get really expensive. Gas is two and a half times more expensive there than it is here. So, and then they 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 take the money that these programs generate and they invest in this world-class subway system that's clean and it's on time and it's safe and it's pleasant and it's comfortable. And people don't people don't miss their cars because yeah. it's a lot easier, faster, safer, and fun to get in the subway or just walk. A countervailing innovation though, that I would imagine is undermining this is the, the growth of all of these uh, semi-human powered electric vehicles like electric skateboards and electric boosted bicycles. Like now it seems like you can get an electric motor in almost every form <laughs> yeah. of transportation that used to be human powered, yeah. Yeah. right? Huh. So people aren't really riding bikes. They're they're riding things that look like bikes, but actually are are, are, are Oh wait, are being I'll tell you something powered. you may may not for people who own an e-bike actually get more exercise than people own a bike. Do they? Because at least they get they're, out. They're getting out. Wow. Yeah, yeah they, they get on them more. And uh -huh. uh, e-bikes, you know, I'm, I I own seven of them, so uh, they can seven be a workout. E bikes. Yeah, I'm, yeah. You know, you know the you know the formula <laughs> yeah. for the ideal number of bicycles, Rich. <laughs> what? However many uh, houses you have. I don't no, know. no, <laughs> no. It's it's n plus one. N being the number of bikes you currently own. Oh, I see. So, so. Oh, yeah. That's a that's definitely a cyclist <laughs> joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it should funny. be everybody's joke, right? But, but um, um, but e-bikes, you know, you get physical activity, just, it's just not necessarily it, you know, in, in Santa Barbara, I live f five switchbacks up from downtown and, you know, you never go out to eat and then, you know, do this mountain gold bike ride back home, but I can flick on my 
e assist and I'll uh-huh. actually use my bike now to go out to dinner right. That's a good because point. I can I can you know it flattens it out for the way back. You still have to pedal, but it's just not as easy. I'm a huge fan of e bikes. Yeah, I've never ridden one. A, a, a treat awaits. Yeah. Well, I don't know. You Mr. got seven, so maybe you can. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you look at these Blue Zones pillars, you know, movement, uh, plant-based, plant slant diet, uh, faith, friendship, connectivity, all of these things, is are they are they relatively evenly balanced? They're certainly independent, they're they're interdependent with each other, but is there one that stands out? It, you know, did you write this Blue Zones Kitchen book because the diet component of it is so important, or how do you think about how, the interplay of all of those? Yes, things? to your point, it, it is a, a mutually supporting web of factors. So people eat wisely; they move naturally every twenty minutes because their life is underpinned with purpose. Uh, they have a social network that makes this easy. Their friends are doing these things. And they live in environments where the healthy choice is the easy choice. Uh So they are definitely connected. But the most important variable there is eating. Uh, Americans probably lose six years of life expectancy eating the standard American diet. This is at middle age, by the way. Uh, Overeating, say, a Blue Zones diet, which is largely beans, whole grains, greens, nuts, and tubers, you know, and and fruits and vegetables as well. Um, So the problem is, uh, except for a few people like you with heroic discipline and a great community supporting you, it's very hard for Americans to go plant-based and, and, and whole food plant-based, by the way. It's not, yeah. you know, Twinkies and chips. Uh, you need to, um, it's, it's whole whole foods, plant-based diet is the most important factor. But the only way to do that for the decades necessary to avoid a chronic disease is have the right social network, live in the right place, mm-hmm. having that sense of purpose where it's important enough for you to be around that you're going to make the sacrifices every occasionally to, you know, not order the hamburger. Or- yeah. Also in this is is stuff about you know portion size, time of day, when to eat. Like it's one of the things you noticed is like, well, the size of the plates that these people are using, you know, is just different than in America. And how does that dictate yes. long term how we, you know. So I'll spin out a couple of the insights uh, captured for Blue Zone's kitchen on how they eat. First of all, they're cooking, no matter where you go, they're only using about 20 recipes, or 20 ingredients rather, over and over and over. Of course, they know how to combine these ingredients mm-hmm. to create a symphonic deliciousness, um, but not a, not a ton of different crazy foods or superfoods. No superfoods, except for beans. Beans is probably the superfood. Number two, they tend to consume all their food in about an eight-hour window. Breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper. Number three, they tend to say say something before the meal that marks a punctuation between their busy life and now we're slowing down to eat, like a prayer, the Adventists or the Sardinians, or harahachibu, which is a Confucian adage that the Okinawans say before every meal to remind themselves to stop eating when their stomachs are 80% full. They tend to eat with their family. They tend to not have electronics in their kitchen, so they're not eating to their favorite song or eating to their favorite mm-hmm. TV show. Um, they, they tend to cook at home as opposed to, to going out. Um, these are all things that um, I, I would argue add to the... Um, ecosystem of eating that produces long-lived people. And the core of which being this, this make, knowing how to make plant-based food taste delicious. Mm-hmm. To me, the most interesting blue zone is Loma Linda. Because when you look at the other ones, they, they are, they've just sort of matured over time as a product of this environment. You know, the surrounding environment contributed to that. Whereas Loma Linda, is in contradiction to the surrounding <laughs> environment, you know? So it's almost more, it's it's so much more impressive to me that they've been able to do this, um, you know, in the context of, of, you know, where you find this city. And that pre- presents the great hope, doesn't it? Because- That's exactly right. Because yeah, if they can do it- like, Yeah, they live, you, you know, to get there from here, you drive down Highway 10, which is six right. lanes, often under a call to smog. 
you exit at Loma Linda and the first thing you see is a wiener hut and a Del Taco. And it's like, what? This is a blue zone? But you go inland a little bit and you see this community of Seventh-day Adventists and they're, they're conservative Methodists who evangelize with health and they celebrate their, their um, Sabbath on Saturday, not Sunday, which makes them, you know, the other blue zones are kind of geographically remote. These guys are a little bit culturally remote because, you know, they kids aren't playing football on Friday night or going to dances and Saturday they're, you know, focusing on their religion and doing nature walks. Um, but it shows a few things. Number one, that your social network, the people you hang out with has the biggest influence on your health behaviors than anything else. They're hanging out with people who other vegetarians, they, you know, they get their diet mm -hmm. directly from the Bible, Genesis chapter one, every plant that bears seed, every tree that bears fruit. So they're eating mostly a plant-based diet. Um, they're a deeply spiritual. They hardwired right in their religion as a nature walk on Saturday afternoon. So um, because of this um, environment that they, that's created around their religion, they are living seven to 10 years longer than the rest of us. And we know that demographically. But it just goes to show you don't have to be an Adventist to, to get this benefit. You, you proactively curate a group of four or five friends. You know, you want, uh, one rich role out there who gets you running and you, you want a, a friend or two as a vegan or vegetarian. Cause when you're hanging out with them, mm -hmm. you're going to be learning how to eat plant-based food. And you want two or three friends who, when you have a crappy day, like we all do, you can call them and they'll care about you. And of course, vice versa. And uh, it's it's this um, building an Adventist like I think social network is a takeaway. You got to make your moai. That's right. Right. Yeah. So I'm just imagining somebody who's listening to this who lives somewhere where they're like, I don't, I've never met anyone who you know eats that way or aspires to live any differently than than how we live. Like, how does somebody who finds themselves perhaps you know geographically you know distant Challenge. from these ideas, you know, and 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 can't find that in their own community. Like, how does that person proceed? I guess they can they can at least start making the food out of your cookbook. Yes, <laughs> right. Blue Zones Kitchen's a started place. Well, uh, first I would think about getting very clear on what my passions are, what I like to do, and what I'm good at. And once you're clear on those those three things, I would volunteer. Um, when you show up to volunteer, first of all, we know that volunteers are happier than non-volunteers, but also you tend to meet other people who are passion-driven. Mm -hmm. And that's a good pool from which to make new friends. Service-minded. Service-minded people. And you know, if you're a dog person, you volunteer for the Humane Society and you walk dogs with other dog lovers, you know, and, and people who love animals are more likely to be plant-based, you know, more likely to not eat animals than, than, um, than, than, you know, people who shoot animals, um, for example. But I would find the vegetarian restaurants and try those or the vegan restaurants and, and try those in a community. And then I, I would, I, you know, I actually have a tool on the Blue Zones website that allows you to go through your social network. You know, if, if we really take kind of inventory on the friends we have in our lives, and this inventory actually asks the questions about how active they are, what kind of food they eat, uh, what, what their temperament is. We often don't do that. We often just, mm. you know, phone rings and, you know, our buddy, Jim, come on down to the bar, you know, we're meeting. And you just sort of follow inertia yeah. as opposed to sort of proactively uh, looking back in your own group of friends to find the ones who are going to help propel healthier habits than the unhealthy one. <laughs> <laughs> I just see like doing this inventory of, of one's relationships and going, holy shit, I need new friends. <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. I, mean? I could just see the red pen. I mean, nope. just like speaking nope. <laughs> of being a product of your environment, like, holy cow, look, these are the people I'm hanging out with. Like, Well, Rich, let me you ask know. you. I mean, you, I, you have this terrific history and, you know, your New York days where you were a big partier and ate different. Than, I mean- I, I have to guess you left the a lot of the pals you were hanging around then behind. Well, yeah, I mean in in uh, in in twelve step they they call them lower companions. <laughs> you know, I but I will say this: like <laughs> I had plenty of lower companions, but I also like I have like 
when I was in New York, like a lot of that was fun. Like, and a lot of the people I was running around with are like really cool people. They just didn't have the problem that I did. And I'm still friends with those people. But certainly, you know, when that, when that like addiction thing turns and you, it starts getting dark, you find yourself spending time with, you know, not the best, not, not the greatest crowd of people. So yeah, when I got sober, I had to like completely change my environment and I invested in the 12 step community here in LA. I, and I knew I was like, I need new friends. You know, I yeah. need a whole new set of friends because left to my own devices, that phone is going to ring and somebody's going to say, hey, we're doing this and that's what I'm going to go do. Exactly. Right? So I had to, in in my own unconscious, you know, semi blue zone way, I suppose, had to like reconfigure my environment without moving geographically, but socially. Well, and, and that's the other thing. I mean, it, making new friends is, is a... Um, it's probably the, the most powerful thing you can do to improve your happiness and your longevity. And there's actually very good research uh, around the impact of, of um, the people you hang out with. But the other thing is you say, well, without moving your geography, probably the most powerful thing to do if you're unhappy is move to a happier place. Mm -hmm. And we know that by following immigrants from unhappy places like uh, Moldavia or the unhappy places in Africa and Southeast Asia, when they move to Denmark, very happy place, or Canada, a very happy place, within one year, their age doesn't change much, their education level doesn't change, their sex doesn't change, their marital st status usually doesn't change, their, their sexual preference doesn't change. Nothing about them changes, but within one year, they start reporting the happiness level of their adopted happy homes. And that often represents a doubling of happiness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're not happy where you're living, um, when you think about it, what's more important than the health and happiness of you and your family, you ought to really think about moving. And, you know, I, I was on this Mel Robbins show this week. I, oh, I know ta Mel. taped it. She's Mel's kind a of, of cool chick. She's a kick in the pants. Yeah, she is. She's she got a lot of energy. <laughs> She does. Did you do her TV show? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, That's I great. think it's going to be out soon. But, nice. but uh, at the end of the, I was on there the whole show, and they they brought out three divorced women. You know, we're having a really tough time, and one of the women is you know fifty seven. Her husband of thirty years did kind of a crappy thing, and you know ran off with another woman, left her in this house. And it's a house on the beach. You know, she kept saying it's a beautiful house on the beach, but it's really isolated. And she can't find new friends, and and uh, she's really lonely. And and I said to her, probably the best thing is move away from this house where you have these thirty years of memories with this yeah. guy who did this, you know, crappy thing to you, and move into a, a community where there's other people like you. Homophily, we like mm -hmm. people like us, where you can walk places. You know, instead of trying to find a pill or, you know, even like joining a club or something like that, move. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the biggest, most powerful thing you can do. It's so counterintuitive. The average American moves 10 times in his or her adult life. So it's not like something we don't do. But uh, we, I think we under uh, celebrate the power of it. Yeah. I think that's great advice. I would, I would add one caveat to that, which is, this is another thing I've learned in sobriety. Like uh, alcoholics and addicts love to move. They love to move. <laughs> See, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, because they've burned a bunch of bridges, <laughs> so they got to get out of Dodge. <laughs> but there is this sort of perverted idea that that moving your geographic location is going to save your problems. Like if you're if you have some kind of emotional, you know, disorder or situation or addiction. Um, Moving your geographic location is not going to solve that because you, the thing, the thing that you don't realize is you bring yourself with you. So you got to kind of work on that as well. But I, other than that, I agree with everything that you said. Yeah, so it's it's not going to change the person yeah. you are on the inside. And if you're addicted or you know emotionally troubled, moving's not necessarily going to address that. But it's going to if you're just a normal person struggling with normal things. I would argue mm -hmm. even a mild depression and anxiety can be am ameliorated by moving. And it's one of these things that it's it just stacks the deck in favor of a better life. It doesn't promise a better life. It's not gonna release all of your demons. It just puts you in an environment where you're 
more likely to bump into people. You're more likely to get physical activity. You're more likely going to socialize. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, everybody else is going to come on and say, I got this product that's going to help you. And I'm going to say, forget all the damn products. I'm, I'm the sort of... Uh -huh. The disruptor and saying no, it's 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 not your behavior; it's your environment. What did uh, what did Mel say when you offered up that advice on the show? Uh, she liked it actually. Yeah. She let me go on and on. Um, you know, she's got this um, um, count to five uh, right. strategy, five second rule, the five second yeah. rule, yeah, which yeah. is not just for dropping your toast uh -huh. on the floor, but apparently whenever you're stressed <laughs> out or. <Yeah. laughs> Or you count to five, and and uh, what what I love about her show uh, is is she uh, so many Americans are struggling, uh, or half Americans don't have four hundred dollars saved, mm -hmm. and she brings them on her show, mm -hmm. and um, she's trying to you know not the dazzling celebrities, she's trying to bring on, uh, I think she's trying to address a growing number of people in this country are suffering and, uh, you know, doing the best she can in an education, I mean, uh, entertainment format, but nevertheless, you know, there's a, a true caring on, on her part and a marshalling of the available uh, expertise. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, she, she has an incredible talent and facility for being able to communicate inspirational, practical ideas to uh, that certain type of person who is suffering in that way. And I, I think it's profound. Like she's yeah. very talented at what she does. She's, she's great. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in, you know, you, we were talking about happiness. Like if you're not happy, move. Um, so much of the work that you've done, you know, we've talked about blue, the blue zones of longevity, but you've also spent a lot of time working on these blue zones of happiness. And in the Venn diagram of longevity and happiness very much overlaps, but it doesn't overlap completely. No. Which in and of itself is interesting. Yeah, if you can, if you can um, situate your life so you're among the 20% of the happiest people in America, it's worth about six years of life expectancy over being in the least happy 20%. Uh -huh. So they're, they're highly correlated. It's very hard to be happy if you're not healthy and vice versa. And the blue zones of longevity, by the way, are in the top, 10% of the happiest places in, in the world. Um, but uh, the places I profiled for blue zones of happiness are different places. Mm -hmm. And my uh, once again, my approach on happiness is if you want to be happier, don't try to change your behavior, you'll fail. And you're probably, you, you become an erotic because um, none, none of these interventions, most of them don't work. And the ones that work don't work for long enough to make a real life change difference. Once again, I argue changing your environment. Happiness itself is a meaningless term because you can't measure it, but social scientists can measure life satisfaction, which is how you look at your life in the rear view mirror on mm -hmm. a scale of one to 10, how satisfied are you with your life? And you can think of your whole life and yeah, you know, I got a good job, give it a number. Then there's how you experience your life, which is how often you smile and, and, um, uh, felt joy in the last 24 hours. And then the third one is purpose. How often do you get to use your strengths to do what you do best? And those three strands come together and they weave together to make what I think is a, of a rope of sustainable happiness. So I found the statistically happiest place in each of those three areas. And then I went and told their story in an effort to marshal mm -hmm. in the science. And Blue Zones of Happiness is really because we have so much data now, it was really trying to um, uh, tell a character-driven story of places that represent the data. So in other words, mm -hmm. the things you can do that stack the deck in favor of happiness. And how do those, where, where do those diverge from the pillars of the blue zones on longevity? I don't think they necessarily diverge. I mean, there's so much overlap. For example, we know that people are eating six servings of vegetables every day. They're not only living longer, but they're also reporting 20% uh -huh. more happiness. Um, people who have a strong social network, arguably the biggest thing you can do for happiness mm. also favors your longevity. 
uh, having a sense of purpose. Purpose is one of the pillars we measure yeah. when it comes to happiness. Mm -hmm. So the, the best crossover in the world is Costa Rica. So Costa Rica is home to not only Nicoya, which is a longevity blue zone, but Cartago, which is up in the highlands near San Jose, which is a happiness blue zone. Mm -hmm. And Costa Rica, interestingly, um, produces more, you know, there's a correlation between GDP, so generally the richer the country, the happier it is to a point, but it's not the whole picture, right? Um, but uh, Costa Rica produces more human happiness per GDP dollar than any place in the world. And it produces more health per healthcare dollar than any place in the world. So it demonstrates that when it comes to happiness and longevity, money's not that important. It's not mm -hmm. nearly as important as we think here in the United States. You need secure. It's, it's sort of security over prosperity. Well, it's uh, they they focus on the things that really lead to um, happiness. So if happiness were a cake recipe, the important ingredients. So you need food. You need shelter. You need some health care. Those all cost some money. You need some education. Flattens off after about a, two years of college. So you don't, not everybody needs a college degree. Um, trusting environment is really important. Uh, having the right partner in life. Uh, having a job with meaningful work. Mm -hmm. The feeling of giving back. These are all measurable uh, ingredients in the happiness and move, you know, if you're, you're where you live is the one with the biggest variance. So Cartago, uh, the happiest places, for example, um, people are socially interacting between six and seven, uh, hours a day, you know, and not wow. on Facebook, not on social right. media. They are sitting across the table from their friend or, so the place I profiled in Cartago was the, uh, central market. Um, these these produce salesmen, and it has the air of a of a bunch of fifty year old frat boys in a way, and frat girls. It's it's a they kind of tease each other, they they uh, help out each other, uh, they joke around. When when somebody gets sick, they all pitch in to help for that person. Um, the cheapest and healthiest foods are the plant based foods they that they sell. Uh, they live a walkable distance from home. They have easy access to nature. These are all things that are going to favor happiness. They're mm. not going to guarantee happiness. They're so at odds with with everything that we've kind of you know premised our American dream upon. You know the idea of like you get a house in the suburbs and you got two cars in the garage and you got the job downtown and you're you know you're it's just everything you know like you're climbing the corporate ladder and it's about getting ahead and that promotion and the two weeks off and putting the money aside for the retirement there is nothing about that that speaks to what we actually have what you have actually discovered and know about what makes people live long and live happily. That's exactly right. When it comes to happiness, most people in this country are, are misguided or just plain wrong. And it's not because they're stupid, but because we're relentlessly marketed this idea that if we have more, if we look better, if we're younger, uh, if we could just get this one thing, financial freedom, a better looking partner, a bigger house, that that's going to deliver us the happiness. And that's always misguided. Happiness is always a cluster of factors that need to come together. It's never just one thing. And we miscalculate the amount of happiness any one goal is going to give by about 50%. So in other words, this thing we think we want, uh -huh. we're wrong half the time. Yeah. Well, the thing is, then you... We're constantly being presented with evidence that we're wrong, right? Like when you get that job or that promotion or that car or that vacation, you have that kind of momentary, uh, you know, excitement around it or sense of feeling good, but it so quickly fades. And rather than challenging the whole setup or dynamic, we say, well, yeah, that wore off, but like, I just need to get that next, when I get the next thing, then it'll really, yeah, it's not you know. bad to have goals, but it, it's bad to think that that to to rely wholly on that goal yeah. and sacrifice too much. Let's just take the context of a day, and I'll tell you exactly what statistically the 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 things that you can do that plan that stack the deck in your favor for happiness. First of all, wake up without alarm. Uh, the happiest people are sleeping between eight and nine and a half hours a day. If you're sleeping six hours, you're about 30% less happy. 
Number two, eat a plant-based breakfast. If you eat a big fatty breakfast or sugar cereal breakfast, you're going to you're going to be hungry midday, mm. you're going to have less energy throughout the day. Uh, number 3, uh, make sure you you have coffee with a friend, you have lunch with a friend. You want to make sure to engineer in 4 or 5 hours or 6 if you can of, of social interaction with people you like. Um, volunteer. Find a little time to give back every day. Worldwide, statistically speaking, volunteers are happier than non-volunteers. Uh, take a nap. Uh, work part-time instead of part uh, full-time. We know from every place in the world, people are working uh, less than about 35 hours a week. Mm. They report the highest level of happiness. Of course, wow. you need to make enough money to cover your basic needs. Mm -hmm. um, Belonging to a faith, it doesn't matter what the faith is, but belonging to a faith stacks the deck in favor of happiness. Uh, watching TV and social media, it seems that about 30 minutes a day of each is optimal. Actually, that provides a little bit more happiness than no social media and no TV at all. But after about an hour and a half of either one of those, your happiness starts to drop off the drop off a cliff. So you don't, uh, you want to spend about an hour a day exercising at least. And that can be somebody as simple as walking and gardening, or it could be, you know, like you do, you know, running a mini marathon every day. Uh, but doing those things are going to stack the deck in favor of happiness way more than shooting for this financial freedom or, mm -hmm. you know, I want a house in Beverly Hills or I'm going to get that promotion, damn it, no matter what it takes. Wrong-minded. Yeah. Where does uh, risk come into this. Like you're somebody who who very early on, you know, developed a, a, a certain kind of relationship with adventure and exploration and risk that that is somewhat unusual in our culture and has kind of birthed this career that you're on. Most people I would characterize as as you know, more fear-based and and risk averse in terms of trying to find that purpose in your life and 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 the sort of willingness required to to place yourself in in uncomfortable unpredictable situations like how do you think about that in the context of of happiness well i go on expeditions not adventures and i never have much respect for the sort of the adventure mm. risk taking i know but genre. you go if you google you it's like national geographic explorer yeah. i'm like i want to be like that guy. that's like the coolest job title ever it is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, listen, you know, you've been on the show a number of times. The first time you came on, you went into detail on on this previous chapter of your life where you set Guinness World Records for for endurance cycling and you've ridden your bike and you've done a lot of other stuff prior to this. So I would characterize you as an explorer. Thank you. I, I'm an explorer, but not an adventurer. You know, even mm. though I biked across Africa, I biked Alaska to Argentina, I biked around the world through the Soviet Union. Collapsed right after I left. And I'd like to. And say you it spent three days with a hundred and two year old woman. Woman, yes. <laughs> yeah, so it's like I would. I, I think that's an adventure. <laughs> it is, but you, you know, know it, it, they it, they weren't risks. They were all yeah. very carefully planned out and calculated to mitigate risk at every. But every explorer and an adventurer says that. Alex Honnold sat across from me and said, like, I, he doesn't think of what he does as being risky because the people there. You've done so much work ahead of time to prepare for that kind of thing. I think what's more risky is, is sitting in front of your TV and eating hot dogs and chips because that that will amount to a certain death and probably a certain you know kind of misery through life. Or oh, heat check. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hear you, but I, I think rather than risk, I've been blessed with this irrational optimism that you know you can do these things that most people don't think about doing or. In fact, you know, people have tried to dis dissuade me from doing them, um, but very few of them require any risk. But in terms of of how you think about finding your purpose, right? Like you have to you have to be willing to try new things and and perhaps even cut against the grain if you're in search of what that might be that will lead you to your you know icky guy. Yes. Well, I think. It's a fairly simple uh, exercise to take a piece of paper, and people haven't reflected on this. Most Americans have never reflected on this. You 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 put four columns, just all the things that you love to do. Then right next to it, same line: your passions, what you're good at, 
And then you you look at the commonalities on where where your gifts are. Where can you put these passions and skills to work? And once you're clear on that, if you then design your career around those the intersection of those mm-hmm. things, you're setting yourself up for success in life. Not because you're going to enjoy the journey, and as you know, it's, it's, we're doing what we love. We're we're more likely to be successful. It's like your podcast. I remember, you know, first time we met, you came over to my house with a little tape recorder. And right. I got this podcast that I didn't yeah. know what it was. It, you know, it sounded like, you know, something you keep makeup in or something. But anyway, the, the, um, uh, and you've, you've grown it into this, uh, empire. And I know enough about you that you're living your passion, uh, every day by not only talking about your ultra endurance, but also using the life lessons you've learned and the life lessons of the people you bring on to better people's lives. And lo and behold, it grows. So it's 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 getting clear on your purpose and 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 then going from there. I think it I think it also is about, you know, finding that thing that you click with, that you connect with, that that you not only have some kind of natural affinity for, but also has been a transformative influence in your life and then figuring out a way to translate that in service to others to perhaps have a positive impact That's on the right. world at large. That's well put. And I've heard you sp- speak about that in so many words before. That service to others is really important too because if it's just a selfish pursuit, it, it, it rings hollow after all. Well, that's, I mean, I think that's the, the, the secret sauce of happiness. And it's so counterintuitive because we're in a selfish culture where we're taught that happiness is a, is a, is a direct result of, of pursuing what's ours or accumulating. But in truth, when you can transcend your ego, get outside yourself and invest yourself in somebody else's problem or issue, um, all your bullshit tends to evaporate and you find yourself more present, grounded, grateful, all of the things that we're seeking in wrong-headed ways come by virtue of doing that. I've heard it so I have to I'm saying that to remind myself. Yeah, you well know? you're it's reminding like, me. It's not too. my natural inclination. <laughs> huh. you know? I, I've heard it summed up really ele- ele- elegantly this. Um, so the four key ingredients to happiness are someone to love, something to do, something to look forward to, and something to give back. Mm. And if you can get those sort of four things into your daily life, you're 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 pretty well set up. That's pretty good. I think that's a good place to. I'll take pretty good. I'll take pretty, pretty good from good. Rich Roll. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite uh, recipe in the Blue Zones Kitchen book? It's um, the Melise Minestrone. So I met the longest lived family in the history of the world. Mm-hmm. Nine siblings, collective age, eight hundred sixty one years. Every day of their life, they had the same lunch: a sourdough bread, a small two or three ounces of of red Cannonale wine and this Mm. minestrone, which is made from black eyed peas, um, uh, lentil beans, garbanzo beans, uh, cruciferous vegetables, uh, onions, garlic, tomato, a little bit of olive oil, um, some um, uh, uh, pasta. And together it creates this absolute longevity stew that's an absolute... Uh, feast for our microbiome, and uh, it's it's also del- it freezes well. It's delicious. I I fed that to an entire city, Albert Lee, Minnesota. I made twenty five hundred dishes, and yeah. this was a meat packing plant city. And uh, their definition of vegetables before this this uh, minestrone was like the orange flex on hamburger helper. Yeah, and I had two, <laughs> I had two uh, boiling cauldrons of in the in this. Uh, and this uh, city ate every last drop of it. Wow, so. that's cool. Um, that's amazing. So uh, you're working now, you've worked now with like over 40 cities, right? 50. 50. Yeah, wow. we just hit 50 cities Holy today. Smokes. Orlando, Florida is the big city coming on and Jacksonville, Austin, Texas uh-huh. with, our, with our buddies at uh, Whole Foods. Nice. That's exciting, man. How many people are, are working for Blue Zones now? About 200. Wow. That's yeah, cool. so it's grown. So is that like looking forward over 2020? Is that occupying most of your time? I mean, I know you do a lot of public speaking and, and the like, like what's on tap for you? Yeah, we started out with an idea and now it's grown and and the challenge now is scaling this and, yeah. and bringing enough 
top-notch talent. So it's it's almost like an adventure of sorts to to uh, build this um, this team so that it can handle the size of the cities that are inviting us yeah. in. And you're working on another book? Not yet. I'm taking a break yeah. from. I have to do uh, one more uh, edition of Blue Zones, and uh, uh, we think there might be one more Blue Zone, and I'm I'm mm. I'm. I'm trying to confirm that if I do, I'll come out with another story in geographic and, and super and a, secret, super secret. Wow. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah. If, if, if it is, I yeah. can guarantee it's the last one on earth, but uh. <laughs> you got, you, you've milked this thing for a lot of books, my friend. Um, I don't blame you though. It's amazing yeah. work. How's Kathy? Is she good? Kathy Freston, yeah. my cruciferous girlfriend who says hi. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She's the, the wow. vegan vixen. Um, you know, she's been a great influence on, um, you know, really an early pioneer in, in making uh, plant-based eating cool. Yeah, Los for Ant sure. Yeah. Huge, huge influence on mainstreaming, what we now kind of almost take for granted, like, oh, vegan options pretty much everywhere you go. But like Kathy played a huge part in yeah. that. Yeah, you got Oprah to you go know. vegan for a while I and know. Ellen DeGeneres and uh, Cross World Kitchens, which I argue is one of the best restaurants in Los Angeles is all plant-based and uh -huh. that would have been seen as a heresy yeah. 10, 15 years ago. Well, kind of a also a big influence on you personally. Like I I think even in the time that I've known you, you've had an evolution in terms of of your plant-based diet, you know, relationship. Yeah, you know, I I come I've come to a plant-based diet by observing the the diets of the world's longest lived people. And 95% of what they put in their mouth is whole plant-based food. But she comes at it you know, sort of the animal cruelty. And mm -hmm. I, I never even thought of, you know, that the occasional piece of meat I ate occasioned, you know, just, just horrible pain and suffering from another sentient being. Um, my, my favorite statistic, she, she told me that an adult pig has the intelligence of a three-year-old human, spends its entire life in a cage it can't turn around in, lives in its own feces, connects with its its young the same way we connect with our young, wants to socialize, feels pain in the same way, uh, yet lives a miserable life and has a horrible death at the end, all in the service of, you know, bacon or pork chop. And yeah. it's, you know, when you add that to the fact that, you know, eating a plant-based diet is probably worth six to eight years over eating a standard American diet, it's just so overwhelmingly right that... Um, not you to can't mention the it. environmental considerations. And that, yeah, it's the third prong. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, we got to round this out here. Um, I just want to say for the record and publicly that you have been a huge inspiration to me um, and, and a bit of a mentor. I appreciate you as an individual, as a human being, as a friend. Um, and I have so much respect for the work <clears throat> that you are doing and will continue to do. You are truly changing millions of lives. And the ripple effect of that will be seen for generations to come because of what you're doing in these cities. And it's really no small thing. I mean, you've you've basically created a term that has entered the modern lexicon. Like everybody knows what the blue zones are right, right now. More. And it starts with you. And so thank you for that. You're a gift to humanity. Oh, br I'm well, very Rich. glad to have you in my life. Brother from another mother. I consider you the core of my Moai, Rich. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, I'm gonna have to get up to Santa Barbara then and solidify that. So thanks, Matt. Thank you for the kind words. Welcome back anytime. And I think that we Did got you hit this record this time? I think, I think it recorded. I think we're good. All right, man. Peace. Lance.